Stephen was nine years old when his big brother was called to the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001. It's always a fresh wound you know, on the 11th every year. I mean, we think about it every day and it's something that we live with every day. You know, they, they never found my, my brother or any, any parts of him. Adamo was wrongly suspected of being a suicide bomber and arrested when she was just 16 and still in high school. I'm 33 now and I, I didn't have my teenage years. That was stolen from me. I didn't have that youth. I just went from preteen to adult. Matthew's father was working at the financial firm on the 105th floor when a plane hit the North Tower. My mom sat us down and said, just explicitly, you know, she's like, Dad, Daddy's not coming home. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think of him or, or remember what happened and how my life was altered completely. Taylor's father rushed to help after the Twin Towers collapsed. He died three years ago from the toxic smoke and dust he inhaled. 9-11 has been a part of my life, right? While I wish my dad was here with me today, I miss my dad. I miss my dad a lot. But I feel him, he's, he's right here, which puts him right here. 20 years ago, on September 11th, their world changed forever. They grew up realizing that they were vulnerable, just like their country and their home. New York City. Matthew Bochy grew up here on the outskirts of New York City. 9-11 also left a gaping wound here. On September 11th, Matthew's father, John Bochy, never returned home from his job in downtown Manhattan. We left hundreds of voicemails until his voice mailbox was full. So my, so we were calling him, and I was like crying and like, you know, begging him to come home. And um, my mom listened to the voicemails because we thought maybe he lost his cell phone. We, in the beginning, it was so so confusing, and we were trying to figure, like, hold on to anything. Maybe there was some sort of last message or something that he left on there. But there was nothing. John Bochy's last known whereabouts were on the 105th floor of the North Tower. A managing director at investment firm Cantor Fitzgerald, he was one of the 2,983 victims of the terror attacks in New York. John and his wife Michelle had four sons. Matthew, the eldest, was just nine at the time. His dad was his hero, a superman, his role model. How did his father die 20 years ago? At the time, nine-year-old Matthew thought about this a lot. He became obsessed with the idea that his father might have jumped out of the window. I would come home from school, and I'd spend hours looking at this stuff. Um, couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, whatever. And it would continue, you know? And was, this is how it was, this is how it was. Then it progressed further and further, and you know, just trying to find out. Hearing what I was hearing wasn't enough, but that's maybe part of my human nature. I want more. You look at this as a kid and you're like, this is the North Tower, you know, and you count down. And so I'm thinking to myself, well, okay, how can I enhance this image enough where maybe I can spot him or someone I know? Yeah, well, well I had, uh... Matthew is currently living at his mother's house in New Jersey. Do you think Here, the past is never far away. The, the grief, yeah. anger, and uncertainty led Matthew down a dark path. Now, on the 20th anniversary of the attacks, the memories are flooding back. And not just for him. It seems like yesterday, and then at the same time, a lifetime ago. And I, I still, I just say, I don't know how I did it, but, and that's what people ask all the time, how did you get through it? But. I would say when you have eight eyes looking at you, you know, the four kids just pretending that everything's gonna be okay and try to, I faked it until I made it, so to speak, you know, just try to get through each day. I would say second by second, I don't even go like minute by, second by second would lead me 
all right, another day behind us. You know? And we had good days and we had bad. Yeah. You know. My mom was young. My, my dad was very young. He's 38 years old, you know? So it's um, taking too soon, you know? Um, but try to move forward and, and be a good person because that's what he would want, so. Adama Ba also tries to be a good person. In the South Bronx, she and a group of other volunteers work to combat hunger. They supply dozens of families with donated food parcels, as the pandemic has left many people unable to feed themselves. When you work in a community, you call them your family because you know them, you know their personal life. They're vulnerable, so they tell you everything. Um, so it's mostly undocumented families. I take it to them and we distribute at nighttime because my families are working. So at nighttime, we give it to them. Skin color, origin, and social status don't matter here. Here, everyone pulls together to help the needy during the corona crisis. 224, Street. Gotcha. Okay, thank you, love. It's a chicken spot, but I'm on the corner. I was once on that line waiting for these food. You were? Yeah, when um, my father was deported, we had to figure out how to make ends meet. It's I was 17 years old, I was working, trying to figure out how to get food on the table, not realizing it was something very hard. Her father had come to the U.S. from Guinea with his wife and their then two-year-old daughter, Adama. She was almost 17 when her dad was arrested and eventually deported. Adama and her American-born siblings stayed in the U.S. Only then did Adama learn she wasn't an American citizen herself and was in the U.S. illegally. Yet, the then 17-year-old was now the head of the household with four younger siblings to look after. Their mother spoke no English and couldn't support the family. Adama recalls her father's parting words. And then he said, be strong. You're the oldest child. It's your job to take care of the family. I said, okay. After the terror attacks, the mood in the country changed. Suddenly, Muslim citizens were shunned, threatened, and feared. The government asked the FBI to round up and detain as many terror suspects as possible. And Adama was one of them. In March of 2005, she was arrested along with her father. Adama was suspected of being a potential suicide bomber. It was FBI, it was police, and it was immigration. And he started searching it. That's when I had realized I was being taken. One of her teachers helped tell her story in a documentary called Adama. She and her little brothers filmed much of it themselves. When they were interrogating me, they said, well, Tashnuba put you down on a list to be a suicide bomber. After interrogation, fingerprints, pictures, and the whole nine yard, we were then transported to Pennsylvania, a maximum juvenile detention center. Um, I was taken across state line without my parents' knowledge or permission. So that was the next destination for me for the next six and a half weeks. After that, she had to wear an electronic ankle bracelet for close to three years. Adama was never charged with anything. Yet, this false suspicion would haunt her for years to come and put roadblocks in her way. I do know that they use fear and they used innocent people like myself to say, look, we're doing something. We just caught a terrorist. Because once I was caught, it was plastered all over the news. Without 9-11, I, a lot of things would be different. I don't think this bitterness and confusion and hatred would be out there. I do know that it's, it, I would have never gone through that. If Muslims wouldn't be the focus or the target. There's no news, there's no news, there's no news. On Long Island, the mood is festive. Thank you for coming. At this sneaker drive, colorful running shoes are being collected to donate to the underprivileged. 
will be doing more things like this. Taylor Lee organized the event. She wants to do good in the world and help where she can. These go up to men's 12. It's a way to carry on her father's legacy. Make sure you get something to eat. He always taught her to think not only of herself, but also to help others in need. This is his taking care of and showing up and providing. That's what he was. He was a giant teddy bear who took care of the people around him, loved the people around him, showed kindness and goodness to the people around him from one place and one place only at the heart. Nothing else. And that's what I'm here for. Jeffrey was a New York City police officer and one of the first from the NYPD who rushed to the Twin Towers to help on September 11th. For weeks, he and his fellow first responders searched for survivors in the rubble. The whole time, they were breathing in toxic dust, often without any protection. And as a result, Jeffrey died three years ago, becoming a late victim of the terror attacks. Each year, all those who died are commemorated at the 9-11 memorial. Along with her mother, Taylor witnessed Jeffrey's long, excruciating death firsthand. The fact that the first responders aren't forgotten gives her strength. Who's brought stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight? Or Each September, family and friends of the victims gather here at the memorial to honor their loved ones. We're so gallantly streaming. You represent exactly what we celebrate in this space, which is fortitude, determination against the odds, tremendous heart, and real grit. Since the day he died, is the NYPD has been there, been there for us, been there for us individually, um, been there for every holiday, every memorial. Um, I was surprised. I didn't expect any of it. Since 2001, hundreds of first responders have died from cancer or respiratory diseases. So it helps their family members, like Taylor, to know that they're part of a larger community and not alone in their grief. Definitely throughout the last couple of years, how I feel is a little different. Um, maybe selfish, I just wish he was here, you know? So I go through periods of, like, why were you here all those, you know, that time? Um, maybe you would have still been alive if you didn't spend so much time here. Now that I have understanding of what being here was and how there was no PPE, right? And even like the day he came, like, you know, he was covered in debris, covered from head to toe. I'm proud of him, right? But I'm sad, because I think maybe less time here, more time on Earth. Steven is parking the fire truck. Today, there's not much action at the Engine 54 fire station, right around the corner from Times Square in Midtown Manhattan. Here, Steven's last name, Regalia stands for tradition. Many members of his family have answered the call of duty here, including his much older brother, Leonard, who 20 years ago set off from this very station to save lives at the World Trade Center. Lenny never returned, just like 14 other firefighters from this brigade alone. Sticking together right to the bitter end just goes with the territory here. 14 of his brother's colleagues went with him into one of the Twin Towers on September 11th and died there with him. Though the younger Regalias only learned of Lenny's death days later. My parents had to pretty much tell all of us and it wasn't like they just sat me down. Like I said, we were a very big family. So there was a bunch of us that were, were together when they, they told us that he wasn't gonna be coming home. And that just kinda, it, it struck everybody very hard. I mean, I really just remember us crying all together. You know, we all just kind of sat there. But the shock didn't stop him from following the same path as his brother and his father before him. I always had, you know, fire trucks growing up, like toys and stuff. So uh, I always was around the firehouse culture and, and whatnot. So that was always fun to me and it seemed like a really fun job. 
Old videos show the firefighters who got together often. The Regalia kids came too. After 9-11, that kind of really solidified that, uh, that this is where I want to go and this is what I want to do. As I got older, it was just kind of like prolonging, just kind of making the time go by until I was able to come to this side and you know, it's been, a, it's been a dream come true ever since. Lenny Regalia fought to save people's lives in the same tower where Matthew's father perished. John Bochy's home office has remained virtually unchanged ever since. Over the years, it's become a place of remembrance for his family. My dad worked on the 105th floor of the North Tower, which is the first one I was hit. So pretty much like up here. Um, and those buildings were meant to not come down, so that's why I think so many people talked about that a lot too. And I don't need to get into all that, but um, you know, the, the way they would sway and then they would still stand upright, that was sort of the metaphor that I've been using, swaying, kind of dealing with the punches of life, but then ultimately standing up, upright. And in my opinion, in my case, moving forward. Sway is the name of the book Matthew has written about his life after 9-11. In it, he explores the torment he experienced following his father's death, how he became a drug addict and almost hit rock bottom. When no one else could bear to hear any more of Matthew's incessant ruminations on whether his father was one of the jumpers, he turned to an uncle who would always listen. That's when I started to talk to other people who I thought were good father figures or trying to step in as a father figure. And they took advantage of that. You know, was one uncle through marriage took advantage of that. Knowing that my dad's death was affecting me the way it was and told me, yeah, your dad jumped. That was how his uncle gained Matthew's trust. No one noticed that he was also making sexual advances to the then 14-year-old boy. Matthew didn't know what to think and simply gave in. That led to me, it led to him sexually abusing me. And, uh, but it led to me now having a new found spark and fire for this quest of finding out what happened to him. And so now I'm being told he jumped. Okay, well now I'm gonna find him in one of these photos. I started to see more graphic images and videos and some things that I couldn't, that were irreparable, I couldn't erase from my memory as much as I w would like to. And I was haunted by it in my dreams and nightmares. For close to two years, he endured the abuse. And only years later did he seek help. The sexual abuse and his father's death took a heavy toll on Matthew, who tried to numb it away with pills and alcohol. And then I got to a point where I mentally and physically, and really in any other aspect, needed, I couldn't live without the drugs, you know? I knew I was an addict, but I just didn't care enough to do anything about it. And I wasn't ready to surrender. And so I had multiple stints in rehabs and detoxes, whatever, but I, still at that point, I, I wasn't, wasn't ready. How's it going? Good to see you. Stop it. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Matthew and Patrick Sullivan have been close friends since elementary school. And Patrick stuck by Matthew during his college days when he was an addict and later during rehab. Today, they're meeting up to celebrate the six year anniversary of Matthew being drug free. For many years, even people who knew me growing up, and like you could obviously be in this, you'd be in the same exact category, they would never think, even though all the other stuff I went through, that that would be me. No. Right? So like the way I drank or Definitely smoked no. before, I didn't cross the line really that, that much. And I think that's what made at least like me and everyone else in your life that was like, how do we help? Unprepared. And I know that the, the issue I had with a lot of our friends, which you remember from college, was that they were kind of like, it's his problem. He has to figure it out. And I'm like, guys, it's so much worse than what you think. Matthew was in deep trouble. He lied to his family, stole money, and hid his problems even from his best friend, Patrick. I know I shouldn't be alive. Um, I got sober at a time when fentanyl was just coming out, and if I didn't get sober when I did, there's probably a 90% chance I wouldn't be here right now. Um, because every single opiate that was out there, pills, 
heroin, everything was cut with it and is cut with it now to this day. So, um, so I'm grateful that I made it out when I did. But, um, and, and, and for me, that's to, sh to show that there is a life with recovery. Taylor and her friend Lorraine Brown are on their way to a photo shoot. It's an ad campaign for their newly founded company. And an old school friend is acting as the photographer. The two women went to school together and now want to go into business together. Enduring the illness and death of Taylor's father have forged a bond between them. It definitely influenced our friendship just being a shoulder for each other, you know? I knew like in those dark moments or in those deep moments, you know, we have to, you know, that's when we need each other the, the most. That's when we have to be strongest for each other, you know, so just being sure that, you know, I'm there for her when she needs and vice versa. My favorite part of our friendship is sometimes I don't know how to say it, right? I don't know how to say like, um, I'm sad or, especially through my dad being sick since 9-11. He was sick frequently in the hospital frequently, and there'd be times where I wouldn't tell anyone. I would kind of just go about, but like, you know, I, but I needed to be around my friends and like her being able to be intuitive and like recognize that without me having to say it. It's important because it's hard to say it. It was hard to say. It was hard to say he's sick, to say he's in the hospital. I kind of would ignore it myself. And um, it's just, nice when someone's able to navigate that without you saying much about it. The two young entrepreneurs began their startup in this living room. Since Lauren has an allergy to tobacco, they came up with the idea of drying rose leaves instead. After being enriched with hemp oil, they're being marketed as rose tobacco. Looking at our patent pending CBD infused rose grava, it is one of a kind, only can be found at Enchanted. The cannabis for their product grows at this hemp farm an hour north of New York City. Hello, hello stranger. How are you? Co-owner Mike Girachi was a protege of Taylor's father, Jeffrey. The police officer believed so much in Mike and the future of his cannabis farm, which produces CBD oil, that he invested in it. And then you would Mike became a family friend and is now a business partner in the new startup. And then you would pot it. Before my dad passed, he, um, He's retired and he was look, you know, he knew Mike started the business and he was very like, in, he was in a stage of his life where he wanted to make investments into things. And this was one of them. Jeffrey had known Mike for a long time. He'd mentored him in a youth program. I was a, a kid that um, liked to cut school a lot. I hated school. Um, couldn't, I didn't understand why we have to sit in class for eight hours and then go home and do homework for another four. Jeffrey taught Mike the value of discipline and helped him finish school. I mean, if the world had more Jeffrey Allen Lees in the world, we'd be living in a much happier and safer, safer kinder. kinder world. <laughs> Thank you. When the country where she'd spent most of her life started treating Muslims with such mistrust post 9-11, Adama began searching for another spiritual homeland. She celebrates Ramadan at this mosque in Queens. Here, all are welcome. It's very important, I think, to have um, a community that you belong to and they respect your identity. And, you know, just to be around them, it feels good, especially at a holy month of Ramadan. Even though they're from a different country, I'm from West Africa, we have a lot of similarities in culture. But in Islam, we don't do culture, we mostly do religion. So what brings us together is our faith. Adama has never discussed her troubles with these women, who are mainly Bosnian, until today. Which one? Unfortunately, I was the first female minor to be arrested and accused of terrorism. So I was detained for six and a half weeks in juvenile detention center. I was released under the agreement that I would wear an ankle bracelet. 
So I wore that for almost three years of my life. I'm glad that you had some type of support. You said you had support from the black Muslim community, so that's great. So I said, now you have the strength to help your children go through anything. Don't get your sneakers wet. Adama is a single mother. Seven-year-old Mohammed and his younger sister were born here. They're both American citizens, but their mother isn't. So Adama lives in constant fear. For six years, she's been fighting to be naturalized, in vain, largely due to her previous arrest. Still, she hasn't stopped trying. Adama is taking the immigration authorities to court. Her lawyer's office is located right on Times Square. Caridad Pastor has taken Adama's case pro bono, for free. She's helping Adama prepare for her hearing at Immigration Services the following morning. Adama is nervous. It's just stressful. But I was thinking, what if it doesn't go in our favor, we still go through the federal court? I think her, her, her entire story is amazing. And I think that basically she's been wronged and I don't like seeing that, so I, you know, I figured I'm gonna do this for her. 9-11, I think people were very fearful, but they looked at it as everybody from this faith is, could be a terrorist, and we have to treat them like that because we don't want another 9-11. The next day, the moment of truth has arrived. Adama hopes that soon she'll be standing here, holding a little flag and celebrating her naturalization in front of immigration services. I'm a little nervous now, but I'm ready. I think everything that I fought for has led to this moment right now, you know. A few hours later, she's disappointed. No verdict was delivered. They told us they'll give us a, a response in the mail. I believe it went well. Um, it went as most of them go after coming back from federal court. They're short, um, they go right to the point, and that's kind of what happened. But Adama is discouraged. Even 20 years after the September 11th attacks, she's still fighting to escape from the shadow of terror, the false accusations, and the hate directed at people of her faith. Yet the children of the victims don't share in that anger. I'm not filled with anger. I think, I mean, as a kid, I think it was natural to have anger and want to blame someone, and I tried doing that. Osama bin Laden was like the, the person that we all hated. What was he? He was like the number one most wanted person in the U.S. or whatever. So I never looked at Muslim people in, I, I never tried to blame them for that um, because it's not their fault, right? Just because people were, you know, there was radicals that did this, they're not to blame. You know, we were nine, so like this wasn't our business. But now that we're this age, like what led up to 9-11? Like having an idea of that, having an idea of relations with the Middle East, being able to discern between culture and religion when it comes to Islam, being, you know, being more open to the idea of like, what is it that has caused this and what can we do so this does not happen again? And I feel like that's what a lot of things in our American culture, we're kind of cleaning up some of the chaos that the older generation has created. Stephen isn't the only one of the regalias to choose a life in public service. Anthony, the son of Lenny, the firefighter who died on 9-11, is just two years younger than his uncle Stephen. His father's death has only increased, not diminished, Anthony's determination to follow in his father's footsteps. They're big shoes to fill, for sure. Being that he was such a big man and um, was always there for the, other, for the guys, and they liked having him around so much. And the years of service he did as well, from NYPD to the FDNY, uh, that for sure leaves a, a big mark to fill. So I think just trying to do my best to be like him and to, to carry on his legacy is uh, the most I can do. Being able to count on one another and putting your life on the line to save others. Those are the rules that they live by. Anthony normally works in Brooklyn, but today the regalias are together at Engine 54. Here, trust, reliability, and courage count as any mission can turn deadly. Anthony and Steven know that 20 years ago, Lenny died while working alongside his colleagues. For them, that's a small consolation. 
They were just kids themselves back then, seven and nine years old. It was, it was very hard. Um, I remember, you know, I was, I was so young, but I just felt myself, you know, getting sadder and sadder as the time went on. I just didn't understand it, like why it had to happen or why it did happen. And from the fourth grade and on, I'd say just about, it was just about accepting it. So I went from understanding it for a little while to now accepting it and just, um, you know, keep being there for my mother and for my brother the most I can and vice versa and just helping each other out. When the firefighters at Engine 54 are waiting to be called out, Joe is often right there. He's one of the last of the old guard. On 9-11, he was at a training session, which probably saved his life that day. 20 years on, working with the regalias is a source of solace for Joe. It's like Lenny, his past, he's gone. He, you know, he was killed, but having them here, He's here, you know. He he uh, he lives through them, and uh, that's how I feel about working with these uh, with these guys. A family of firefighters, the Regalias never questioned their calling, even after 9/11 and the loss of a beloved father and brother. I think it's you know it starts here where my father was a firefighter, and pretty much it, it trickled down to our whole family where we all are now first responders and doing things, you know, that make a difference overall and that we just love doing what we do. Matthew has been invited to speak at this country club in New Jersey. The guests are all donors who support a free community clinic. Matthew's story is to help raise awareness about those suffering from mental illness and addiction. He's here to tell people how he escaped his downward spiral and fought his way back to health. The best part about it all is that Matthew has come out on the other side, restored, rehabilitated with us tonight to inspire us with his words. Matthew John Bochy. Hi, everyone. I had a breaking, a breaking moment where uh, it was the defining moment that got me sober officially. Um, I was facing jail time. I had multiple felony charges, and uh, I knew I could go one way or go the other. Um, I worked in, in finance in Manhattan, um, and here I was facing jail time. And um, that is a true result of what addiction does to people. Thank you so much. For Matthew, moments like this one are the proof that he's made it. People are buying and reading his book. In spite of all his suffering after September 11th, he's never sought revenge. Back in 2011, when Osama bin Laden was killed and people gathered at Times Square to celebrate, Matthew was still in college. I was just sitting there and everyone was like cheering and there was like, everyone was looking at me like, oh, aren't you so happy? Like, aren't you so thrilled? And what I did instead was I left my dorm room. And I walked across, where, across the campus to go to the cathedral. And I sat there and I just prayed. And I just like reflected. A decade on, he's found his own route to happiness. I talk about these things to show people there is hope, that you can be resilient and get through the other side and overcome it, just like I have. Everlasting flowers. Taylor buys an arrangement to decorate her father's grave on his birthday. The florist's shop is located near Pine Lawn Cemetery on Long Island, where many victims of 9-11 are buried. Some are even honored in this store. Jeffrey's photo hangs here. Thank you, thank you. You guys made it better for sure. My dad's not forgotten. He's every, multiple times in the year, my dad's remembered. And it's like, it's by, it's by like the people that run the 9-11 committee ceremonies and things. And it's just like, I needed this. Jeffrey's legacy lives on. That's clear from the admiration in which he's held by the many people he's helped. Waiting with Taylor's family by his grave is Erica Vinces, a young woman who owes much to Jeffrey. He was called Papa Bear, 
because he patiently and lovingly put young people on the right path. Young papa bird. Young, young, young. Erica was also in Jeffrey's program for at-risk youth. We have this black man as our father that taught us how to be a person, compassionate and loving. Uh, even though we weren't, we weren't gifted that in life, we found it on our own, and he kind of just defined it for us. He, um, he kind of helped my moral compass, at least for me. And he was a very upright man; like he was just so respectful, officer and a gentleman. He loved a yellow cake. Three years after his death, they decided not just to mourn his passing, but also to celebrate his life. Lenny Regalia Way is named after the fallen firefighter. It's also where his family honors the life of their missing brother, son, and father. For a final time, the family meets at the house where the 11 siblings grew up. Lenny and Stephen's family home is now too big and is being sold. Stephen, his seven older sisters, and two brothers have made Leonard Sr. and his wife Maureen grandparents 30 times over. Yet they still feel the loss of the eldest son, Lenny, acutely. It's not as bad as the first few years, but it doesn't go away. And then as you see, his children mm -hmm. grow and the other kids grow. And they all know Uncle Lenny, even though they never met him. The young ones, they have their shirts and they all know who Uncle Lenny was. My youngest one, he had said to me, I don't know if I want to be a fireman or do I want to go in the Marines? And he asked me what he should do. So I chose the, the fireman, and I said, at the same time, my heart was aching that he would really follow through. But he was 10 years old, and he said, I want to be just like Lenny. Lenny Regalia's father was also a fireman, and now almost all of the Regalias have become police officers, paramedics, healthcare workers, or firefighters, including Leonard Jr., the second oldest son of the firefighter who died on 9-11. You know, the younger generation always look up to the older generation. Like, I looked up to my father and my brother, which led to me doing it. And, you know, younger ne nephews that always look up to, and now they say what we said when we were kids, that they want to be a cop. Like, he says all the time that he wants to be a cop. He had a cop birthday theme party. Uh, you know, so that's, I think it's just going to be a, a continuous thing. Lenny and Steven's sisters now have grown children who work as first responders. They're proud of them, but they worry nonetheless. Every time you know that they're working, or he's working, it's, you know, you always just think, is something bad gonna happen? You don't want, you know, it's always in the back of your head since it already happened to us. And every time so, happens, you're like, oh, New York, you know, a bomb went off, or somebody was shot. The first thing I do is text them, like, are you working, where are you? And sometimes they don't answer, and then it takes you back. To that day, like, you get an answer. The regalias know that joy can give way to grief at any time. All the generations are united in their commitment to working for the common good, despite knowing the big risks involved. I mean, being where we work, it is obviously a big target in, in Times Square. But, you know, like we've said, it's, we're ready for anything. You know, we, we train constantly for these scenarios and these situations, and it's, I wouldn't say it's, uh, you know, if it's gonna happen again, I'm sure somewhere something is gonna happen again. But, uh, you know, wherever it does happen, where, or if it's in our, around here, you know, we're ready for it. A month has passed since Adama's naturalization was adjourned. But then comes the good news. She's won her legal case. And today, she's to become an American citizen. I want to sleep, I want to cry, I want to eat, I want to yell, I want to scream. I have mixed emotions right now. I was here 16 years ago, and it's ironic how I'm swearing in as a citizen at the same building that I was interrogated at, that I was treated like garbage. Her lawyer, her children, and her friends have come to celebrate Adama finally becoming a U.S. citizen. Immigration attorney Caridad Pastor explains why she thinks it's taken so long. There's extra screening for certain populations and certain religions. So there's extra screening for people who are Muslim. 
So that's a part of it. And then because of that extra screening, I think officers sometimes are uh, over eager to do their job and they'll pick on something that, you know, what isn't really a showstopper, but you know, that, that becomes then a big issue. I did it finally. Morning. The day is a huge triumph, a victory over bureaucracy and against prejudice. It's a true happy ending for Adama and her family. I think this just proves my innocence all along. I've been telling everybody I was innocent. This just actually proves it. <laughs> so, yeah. For Adama, the Statue of Liberty symbolizes everything that's good about America, despite the prejudices and problems she's had to overcome. So she's celebrating by taking her family on an excursion there. But even here, September 11th casts a long shadow. A lot of the people who lost loved ones in 9-11 became first responders. They had gone off to do college. This country really took care of them. They made sure that they were okay, that they were there for them. While people like myself were punished for it. Innocent people like myself were punished for something that we should have never been punished. We should have been included in that healing process, but we were punished instead. That was honestly that- It's thing. due to this bitter realization that Adama plans to keep on fighting against injustice on behalf of other immigrants. My goal is now to make sure what she says, what the Constitution says, we hold people accountable and make sure they allow us to live in liberty and free. The children of 9-11 all have something in common. They want their lives to have meaning. A senseless act of violence has spawned in them a sense of responsibility, a willingness to do good, and help others. They plan to step out from the shadow of terror and into a brighter, and better future.